Welcome, Christ is risen, everyone. This is David. Today we're going to be look at looking at ecumenical councils and how they shaped Christian history. Uh, this is going to be on a basic level. We're not going to go too high IQ, and we're going to be sticking it to the seven ecumenical councils. But before we really look at the ecumenical councils and see what happened in them and the theology that was explicated in those councils, I think it's very important. First of all, we need to understand how we're supposed to view them in the first place. Ecumenical, uh, a big misnomer we have today is that people think ecumenical councils are these magical councils that was dogmatic before it even started and people just debated in it and then boom, 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 boom. Uh, documents were stamped, spread out, and everyone was like, okay, this is an ecumenical council. I guess that's what we believe now. That's not how any of these councils worked. In fact, ecumenical council means imperial council, right? It does mean, oh, command does refer to universal. Um, it does have that meaning, but its meaning is strictly within imperial context because the empire saw itself as universal because of its Christian culture. So one of the reasons why we don't have ecumenical councils today, and I'm speaking because I'm an Orthodox Christian, is because we don't have an empire. How can we have imperial councils when you don't even have an empire? Whereas in the Roman Catholic Church, you have multiple ecumenical councils, more than 20, which goes to show this kind of difference over time. Uh, but from the beginning, ecumenical councils were just imperial councils and many councils that started as ecumenical, meaning imperial, like Ephesus 2 in 449, um, considered itself or Hierias in 754. These councils considered themselves ecumenical but were not accepted. So we have to radically change what we understand by ecumenical. Um, these councils were received over time. So when these councils that I'm going to be talking about, like Nicaea, um, when we talk, or Nicaea, right, that's the Greek, that's the proper way of saying it, but whatever, um, it wasn't just instantly received, right? A lot of people just looked at the council and said, yeah, you know, whatever, I don't care. And they just did what they used to do. So it took a long time. In fact, I think the Persian church, it took the Persian church a century to accept the Nikin Council. I mean, it took them that long. And, and this might be even a little bit of a radical statement, but I think it really will help a lot of people if they understand things this way. The dogmatic status of ecumenical councils compared to local synods that we accept as dogmatic, like the local synod of Constantinople, and I, I believe, I refer to this synod in, um, in the Theology of Icons video that you can check out, in 843, the dogmatic status of that council is no different than the dogmatic status of the ecumenical council. So we have synods that are dogma as dogmatic as ecumenical councils. So for some people, so this idea that the only dogmatic councils are the ecumenical council, what we call ecumenical councils, is actually not really true. Um, and in fact, one could even argue there are more than seven, right? You can refer to uh, the Photion Synod of 879 is ecumenical. You can refer to the Hesychas synods in the 14th century. They can constitute the ninth ecumenical council. But I'm going to be focusing on the first seven because we're going to stick to the basics here. Maybe in a sequel, maybe in a later video, we're going to be talking about those other councils in the future, right? But what I want to stress again is these councils were received over time. They weren't received instantaneously. Many of these councils, for example, the second ecumenical council again, um, the only reason we accept the se Second Ecumenical Council as dogmatic is because the Fourth Council, Chalcedon, actually received it as dogmatic, and we accepted Chalcedon. Um, so that's one of the examples that I wanted to use. So, And it also illustrates to you that there wasn't this kind of papal supremacy system in the early church at all. So the, that kind of stuff but didn't exist. But what also didn't exist is the idea that we can just take these councils on their own and pick and choose what we like. Many of these councils were associated with the saints who in a way influenced and spearheaded said councils. And in the presentation, there's going to be icons of these saints that you that we're going to be referring to, that these saints were particularly important. These saints, for example, St. Athanasius was important for 
the Nicene Council in the 4th century. You can't just accept Nicaea. That you can't, you can't just accept the first council and then reject Saint Athanasius. It's just impossible, because the f because the theology of that council is based on the theology explicated by Saint Athanasius, and many of the different councils operate on that same basis. That's why the sixth council, although it does not refer to Saint Maximus the Confessor, its theology, its ideas, are those that are that were explicated by Saint Maximus. Um, just to give you an example. So I hope this helps you understand before we even dive deep into these councils and what happened in them. First Ecumenical Council, uh, the first council of Nicaea in 325, decreed that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is homoousios with the Father, meaning that he is of the same essence. Uh, and in the Nicene Creed of 325, I'm not referring to the 381, but this is the kind of or o the OG one. It says, that we believe in, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made consubstantial with the Father. So the Son of God, His being, His essence is of the Father. So the divine nature that we're speaking of in the Trinity is the divine essence of the Father. And as Dr. Bo Branson in his presentation on the monarchy of the Father showcases, the primary um, point of the Nicene Council was not actually to prove the divinity of the Son. That's the second purpose. But the, the primary purpose was to prove that God is the Father and that He has a consubstantial Son. Just like, this is only an analogy, right? Um, I'm not saying the begotten, the divine begottenness is exactly like human begottenness. I'm not saying that. This is an analogy, but similarly how a father can beget a son, they necessarily have to be of the same nature for that begottenness to be proper. <clears throat> this council was not instantaneously accepted, as I pointed out. Uh, the, pro the problem of Arianism, which is the idea that Christ was merely a God, but he was not of the same essence with the Father. Uh, it still loomed, even though Nicaea dealt with that issue. Even more, in fact, more extreme forms of Arianism started to come up. Um, and also, many fathers of the church didn't even necessarily instantly use the theological formulas of this council. Many fathers, in fact, they accepted homoousios very slowly. <clears throat> and that's pretty perfectly reasonable because although, and I forgot to mention this at the start of the video, but for us, we consider these doctrines to never change, right? So every single council that we're going to be talking about, the doctrine doesn't change. We're not talking about changing or updating doctrines. Rather, our understanding is going to be in a way updated. So that doesn't just happen instantaneously. It takes time. Language is complex. Words can have multiple meanings. Wow, that's so surprising. I mean, it's a lot of people don't seem to understand that. Unfortunately, a lot of polemicists miss the point that words have multiple meanings. But a lot of people have this 21st century mindset where they think that language, you know, these language issues can be very easily solved. Not really. That's not really true. Now, I'm not saying that schisms can happen merely due to language because actually this is proof that language issues can be resolved. But many fathers, for example, they were very of homoousios language because homoousios could refer to persons. And if the persons are homoousios, they, it could mean for them, oh, then they are just all the same person then, which will mean Sabellianism. So we have the Second Ecumenical Council, which is the First Council of Constantinople in 381, that more, goes into more detail, uh, more detailed distinctions of these terms and crystallizations of these terms primarily by the Cappadocian fathers mainly Saint Gregory the theologian who funny enough in this council actually resigned um, from being a bishop because of political intrigues that were going on and they elected an unbaptized politician um, to be the president of the council and it still worked out right it still worked out but it's a re reaffirmation of the condemnation of Arianism alongside with its extreme variants like eunomianism was dealt with, pretty much uh, the spirit fighters, those who denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit were also condemned, which is 
the the Nikin Constantinopolitan Creed affirms this, right? It it deals with this issue, um, as well. For instance, in the original Nikin Creed, there is a statement that says, "And in the Holy Ghost, that we believe in the Holy Ghost," but it doesn't really move more from that. Whereas the Constantinopolitan version of that creed uh, says, "And in the Holy Ghost." Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. A further detailed explication, not as if the First Council didn't affirm this, but a detailed explication of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So this is what this council was very important for, is to really explicate the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, again, we have to kind of understand that um, the doctrine of the Trinity was believed in even before these councils. So, we not there is no such idea that suddenly these councils made everyone force everyone to believe in these things that is absolutely not the case that is a atheistic secularistic reading that is very specific to christianity if you read that wave to any other worldview you will have even worse worse results but this kind of hermeneutic for some reason is only applied of course, to the Christian faith, because you can find great examples, from, not only from Scripture, but also from early church fathers of the Trinity. Sure, yeah, they don't use the word Trinity. So what? Right? They're merely terms, but the concept is still there. For example, the Cappadocian fathers, many of them, they don't refer to Holy Spirit. You don't see them oftentimes excluding St. Gregory the Theologian. Oftentimes, they don't really refer to Holy Spirit as God. But like St. Basil, for example, but he has a treatise on the Holy Spirit and the whole point is to prove the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So if you kind of get bogged down to these, these terms like a stupid nerd, we're going to get absolutely nowhere. And first of all, and even elementary school kids understand that language can only go to some place. We kind of have to understand that what's important is the concept behind it, right? For example, I, I love using this example. Imagine you have two people, two distinct people, and they have the same name. So are they the same people because they have the same name? And, you know, oh, they're both John. So uh, when I say John is stupid, it automatically applies to the other John as well. Or if I say John is smart, it automatically applies to the other John as well. <laughs> of course not. That's not how it's how it works. And finally, the Second Council dealt with the issue of Apollinarianism. So now there's a Christological problem here, um, which is the idea, heretical idea, that Christ does not possess a rational human soul and or a rational human mind, and the implicit idea that the personhood, that personhood is, is proper to mind. These were condemned ideas, and forgot to mention here that Sabellianism, also known as modalism, which is the idea that the persons of the Trinity are merely forms, personalities, or masks of one subject, is also condemned. Then we have the Third Ecumenical Council, the First Council of Ephesus, which decreed that the Virgin Mary is Theotokos, and this is because Christ is a single divine person, and the acts bef befitting his humanity and divinity are attributed to him. There is not a different person that we can attribute these things to. It attributes to the one sole single subject. Nestorianism is condemned. I know that I've just realized there's a spelling error. It doesn't matter. Uh, the 12 Anatomies of St. Kirill, alongside his epistles to Nestorius, were the main documents used by us to condemn, condemn the heresy of Nestorianism, which is specifically uh, his Christology. Uh, one of the main issues with this council, well, I don't, want, I don't like saying that to a council, but one of the main issues that happened later on with this council is um, Nestorianism wasn't really a monolithic Christological model. There are different kinds of Nestorian models. Some Nestorians will say that the Virgin Mary is Theotokos, but they will still have a Nestorian Christology. So we will see later on in the Fifth Ecumenical Council uh, actually kind of goes more into detail. But before we do that, we're going to look at the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon, uh, you, which condemned the idea of Eutychianism, which is specifically that the idea that Christ is a Christ's nature, Christ has a mixed, fused nature of humanity and divinity, is condemned. 
what it's what the fourth council says that Christ is in two natures. He possesses a full human nature alongside a divine nature. And I think and I personally think this is a crucial aspect of the council. The term prosopon uh and the term hypostasis the term hypostasis became very very crystallized. It very much implied that when you refer to something as a hypostasis, like one of the persons of the Trinity, that you refer to them as person. Because the good aspect of the term prosopon has been kind of injected to that term, which is why they were used as syn synonyms in the Council, whereas the bad aspects that are incompatible with the term hypostasis just implicitly faded away with the term prosopon. Because you could say three prosopon uh, in, refer in reference to the Trinity, but prosopon in Greek... It does mean person, but it also means a personality, a character, a mask, right? Uh, it's called mean a disposition. It's a biblical term that doesn't really mean person. St. Kiel actually uses this term multiple times, but he doesn't use it in the sense of person. Chalcedon makes it so, right? It kind of basically crystallizes that meaning for hypostasis. And there's a connection of terminology and metaphysics of the Trinity and Christology thanks to the Council of Chalcedon. And finally, because of the Tome of Leo, and this is an issue that happens in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, but this was dealt with in Chalcedon early on, Christ has the full faculties of these two natures. These include the energies of these natures and also the wills that are proper to the natures. Saint Leo's tome was actually in a very in a was very important in that aspect for this council, and many modern commentators missed that. But one commentator that did not miss that is Saint Sophronius of Jerusalem, who was instrumental in the Sext Ecumenical Council as a figure. Moving on to the Fifth Ecumenical Council, the Second Synod of Constantinople in 553, Nestorian and Originist interpretations of Chalcedon were absolutely rejected because between this period which i do plan to make a video on it in the future and forgot to mention i have made a defense of the council of chalcedon in response to monophysite polemicis uh, you can go check that out in this the the nestorian interpretation and the origins interpretation of chalcedon were were very prominent at those times the fifth ecumenical council deals with those interpretations and absolutely rejects them and affirms that they are incompatible because oftentimes they just kind of removed certain things they didn't like, right? It's the same thing that happened with the Council of Ephesus. Nestorianizers just removed aspects of the Third Ecumenical Councils uh, just to make it more palatable to themselves. That's not how you're supposed... It's very Protestant, isn't it? I mean, it's just... Well, it existed back then as well. Originism is just completely condemned alongside Origen himself posthumously. Theodor of Mopsvestia, who was an historian, is likewise posthumously condemned. So the different historian models that I'm referring to have actually been dealt with in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. But what also has been in a way dealt with in the Fifth Ecumenical Council is the monophysite, the severin kind of monophysite response to Chalcedon has also been dealt with, dealt with. It showcases that the theology of Chalcedon is completely compatible with the Christology of St. Kirill of Alexandria is completely compatible with the Bible. It is completely compatible with the Orthodox faith. And that's what the Fifth Ecumenical Council showcased. That's why St. Justinian the Great is actually incredibly instrumental for this council. And he has writ written great treatises on this issue. And it also accepted Kirillian Miaphysite expressions that are accepted within Chalcedonian context. And one of the beautiful things about this council is that it just reaffirms certain things that was always already the case with Chalcedon. For example, the people who wrote the Chalcedonian Creed, um, which spoke of Christ being in two natures. If you look at the people who wrote the document, most of them were Miaphysite, you know, in Christology, they were Miaphysite proponents. Yet they did not see any issue with expressing a deophysite confession because in the Orthodox faith, both Christological models, in not models, I don't think, uh, both Christological expressions can express the true doctrine. So someone may, may ask, okay, how are you different from the Orientals then? 
Are you, are you saying you have the same Christology? Absolutely not, because their model is strict Miaphysite Christology. It's kind of like, you know, Islam, you can call them strict monotheism. It's not as if we are not monotheists, we are monotheists. But the Islamic model is, in that example, is strict monotheistic, where they completely are against the idea of multiple persons um, in the Godhead, for example. Similarly, strict Miaphysite expressions basically reject two nature expressions, but Two nature expressions, the diophysite expressions, are actually very necessary in your Christology. Otherwise, you end up leading yourself to uh, many different issues. As I've showcased in a video, three-hour video, dealing especially with the Christology of Severus of Antioch, who was the Thomas Aquinas of the Oriental uh, Communion, the non-Calcedonian Communion, special attention dedicated to his Christian, and, and alongside all, many of their other saints, right? So it's absolutely, their Christology is absolutely incompatible, but I'm just touching the surface level here, right? These are the things that the Fifth Ecumenical Council did. I already talked too much. I do plan in the future to make a video on this issue um, between the time period of uh, Chalcedon and the, fifth the Fourth Council and the Fifth Council, what happened between that period, because it is actually very important. If you want to kind of understand proper Christology, it's very crucial that you understand the history and the theology of that period. Otherwise, you're absolutely going to miss the mark. Trust me on this one. Uh, I will definitely, I've already done several works on this, but I will do more in the future. Let's move on to the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Constantinople III in 681. Uh, it's kind of simple. It reaffirms Chalcedon in the idea of Christ having the full faculties of both natures, which means that he has two wills and two energies. But the implication here of this council will also be that Christ has a free human will. Human will is free in Christ, and therefore we have a proper free will. Uh, Christ can have a proper full human will that does not contradict or oppose the divine will. And this is actually very significant for anthropology and how we understand salvation. This is a direct refutation of the kind of monergistic doctrines that a lot of Protestants have, where they basically says, in our salvation, the only will that matters is the divine will. The human will does not matter when it comes to the salvation. Christology, or the correct Christology, absolutely decimates that understanding. If in Christ, there is no free human will, then in salvation, our human will doesn't matter either. But God desires the salvation of all men. Therefore, what would be the case? Well, the Fifth Ecumenical Council kind of deals with this. Originism. Universalism. That's what will be the case. So we can't accept this doctrine at all. So this affirms that the human will has to cooperate, co cooperate, cooperate with the divine will of God in order to attain theosis and salvation. So this is actually one of the big implications of the Sixth Ecumenical Council that, again, modern commentators miss. But Orthodox commentators do not miss this because they read St. Maximus the Confessor because we are the church of St. Maximus the Confessor and we take what he says seriously. Finally, the Seventh Ecumenical Council Nicaea, the Second Council of Nicaea, icons are accepted in the church. Notice, icons, not images, not artistic portraits in the church. Icons specifically are what's accepted in the church. What church uses proper iconography and accepts this council? Only the Orthodox Church, right? Are there maybe there are a couple of churches that, you know, fringe churches here and there that might use council, but in the which church actually accepts the theology of the Seventh Ecumenical Council? The Orthodox Church. It lives in our liturgy. And if you want to know more about the theology behind icons, I have a video on that as well. Theology of icons that you can check out. I'll put a link in the description below. Maybe in the top right bar, if you're lucky, if I feel like it. But 
It also means that Christ can be depicted in icons in his humanity. Um, so it, it is because he is human that we can depict him, right? We can't depict the divine nature, but um, what is incircumscribable is now circumscribed because of his human nature. Veneration of icons and how it ultimately refers to the person that is depicted that relationship is properly explained with the doctrine of the divine energies. Um, again, this is more. This is explained more in detail in that video. I'm just keeping it basic here, but I just want to say this is the seventh council is not accepting secular images. It is not accepting that kind of stuff. Not statues. Not any of that. So it is specifically dealing with the issues of icons. Icons are a specific tool of the church. They are not, absolutely not, a secular insertion that is in the church. They are a creation of the church. The church possesses icons. No one else possesses icons. They don't. right? So a statue is not an icon. So the Seventh Council doesn't deal with statues, for example. It doesn't deal with any of that kind of stuff, but it deals specifically with uh, icons. That's kind of understand uh, Im understand to important. I, I wasn't even going to say that, but it's important to understand that. And finally, uh, the Eucharist is not an icon. Uh, this is a point that iconoclast brought up. They will say that the Eucharist is merely an icon of Christ. The Eucharist is not an icon. It is quite literally the body and blood of Christ. It's not a. Is there an iconographic symbolic meaning of the Eucharist? Absolutely, yes, there is. Of course, there is. But it's also the body and blood of Christ. So, and as the liturgy says, we bow not before flesh and blood, but before you, O also Lord. And speaking of liturgical uh, liturgy, St. Justinian is also important. I forgot to mention this, I'm sorry, but as you can see in the icon, it says, Only begotten Son of God, Im Son, Immortal Word, uh, I'm I'm really I'm stupid. I, I can't read it properly, but um, um, this hymn is what we refer to as the just the Justinian's hymn, um, which was a response against origins, and it says, "Only begotten Son and immortal Word of God, who for our salvation did will to be incarnate of the Holy Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, who without change did become man and was crucified, who art one of the Holy Trinity, glorified with the Father and the Holy Spirit." O Christ our God, trampling down death by death, remember it's Pascha, save us. Right? He's risen, so um, let's not forget that as well. Uh, at the time that I'm making this video, maybe you're going to be watching this video and it's not Pascha, it's, Pen it's after Pentecost, but still got to keep that spirit. And um, so the people, again, that are responsible with these councils, the saints, are very important. You cannot separate them. From the councils in a way. Uh, and that's all I have to say for this video. Yeah, that's an uh, overview of how these ecumenical councils shaped and changed Christian history and why they are so important. Sure, they're not more dogmatic than dogmatic synods, but they are very crucial for Christian history and or beliefs. And I want to finally say that the only church you will ever find in the world that actually abides by these ecumenical councils, by these basic Christian doctrines, the only church, there's only one church that probably abides by them. Yes, sure, there are Protestants that claim to accept these councils. There are Roman Catholics that claim to accept these councils. But there's only one church, one body of Christ that actually lives these councils. It's important to live the faith, live the faith of the councils. And that is the Bob Marley Church. I'm just kidding. Of course, it's the Orthodox Church. It's the Eastern Orthodox Church. And that's what I want to end my video with. Christ is risen, everyone. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next video. God be with you all. Thanks for watching.